Okay, hi everyone. As we, as we just wait for our final speaker, I'll just go over our, our webinar housekeeping um, for today. So just to let you know that we, um, your audio and video are disabled um, for the webinar, just because we, uh, to allow the speakers um, to speak clearly as we'll ha we have so many attendees today. It's wonderful to have so many of you with us, but you don't need to worry. We won't be able to hear you or, or see you. Um, um, so please don't worry um, if, you, if you speak during the webinar. You are, um, however, able to post questions and we really hope you do. We would love for you to, to send in your questions as we will have 30 minutes question and answer at the end of the webinar. So you'll see at the bottom of your screen, a Q&A function. So please send a, um, a question at any time. Just a reminder that this session is being recorded um, and um, all of our webinar recordings are available on the NE website um, along with the presentation. So please do feel free to share those with your colleagues after the webinar today. We also have closed captioning available in English. Um, you'll see the CC button at the bottom of your screen um, and also in, in other languages. Um, and uh, my wonderful colleague Peter has shared those in the chat with you. Um, so do look out for those. And we are really grateful as well today um, to have um, Jacqueline joining us um, doing ASL interpretation as well. Um, and so huge thanks um, to her and, and uh, um, Josh for making that happen. I think we've got all our speakers now. So without further ado, um, let's get underway. Um, Hannah, if you could move to the next slide, that would be fantastic. Thanks, Hannah. So hi, everyone. Welcome um, to the webinar today. Today's focus is on inclusive education um, during COVID-19. Um, as you know, here at INE, we are running a webinar series about education and emergencies in COVID-19. The goal is to really give a space to come together and share practical recommendations and examples with each other um, during this complicated time, as we know many of you are working tirelessly to continue education provision um, in these unprecedented circumstances. Um, you can find all of our recordings on the website. The topic today is a really important one for us here at INEE and we know it's very important to all of you. We've heard from our members in recent weeks that this is a real, a real priority area and that there are real concerns that um, we make sure as we adapt programmes and policies quickly that we make sure we're including all children. I'm very grateful for, for the panellists for joining us today and, and to all of you. Um, so thank you for being on. Before I talk about today's agenda, I'm just going to hand over to um, my wonderful director, Dean Brooks, here at INEE for more of a formal opening. Thank you, Dean. Uh, thank you, everyone. Really um, happy to see so many of you on, on this uh, webinar. I, I'm looking at the number now. I see over 270 people, and I think that's so great. This is such an important topic, um, one that we're very excited to actually talk with you about. Um, and just to say, you know, we know that uh, with COVID-19, that children with disabilities, young people with disabilities, gender issues, language issues, inclusion cover so much. And these are the most vulnerable. These are who we really have to make eff extra efforts to reach. I want to thank uh, USAID for providing us with ASL interpretation. Um, very excited to see INE offering that uh, service today. Um, and hopefully in the future, we'll have more opportunities to show and be an example uh, of how inclusion can really take place. I encourage all of you to pay attention to um, uh, the fact that uh, the INE minimum standards does have uh, inclusion um, as a cross-cutting issue. Um, and I also wanted to mention that INE has a task team on inclusion um, that um, in the past has created guidance on, on being inclusive and how education and emergencies can be inclusive. Um, and uh, welcome, you know, encourage all of you to, to visit the website and, and see the, the resources that we've been able to curate uh, related to this, but uh, I want us to jump into this topic. Uh, it's such an important topic. I, I can't say that enough. And, uh, and thank you again. Uh, we're almost at 300 folks on the call, so very excited um, to get started. Uh, thank you, Charlotte. I'll hand back over to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dean. Um, and as Dean says, we do have a, a packed agenda. Um, so just to give you a sense of that agenda, agenda rather, Hannah, if you could just go to the next slide. 
So um, we have a range of speakers today covering some core, core areas of this topic. So we're going to begin with a sort of an overview orientation around inclusive education in COVID-19 and some key considerations for us to, to think about. Um, we'll then um, think about uh, advocacy for inclusive education at this time um, from our colleagues at IDDC and, and the recent uh, response that you may have seen and, and we'll share with you all. Um, and then, um, from Humanity and Inclusion, we'll hear some really practical recommendations and resources they've created um, to support inclusive um, COVID-19 programming. Um, and then we'll follow with, um, really excited to be joined from colleagues from a range of contexts to share their really practical work that they're doing at this time to support inclusive education. So um, three examples from, from Nepal, from East Africa, and, and then from Kosovo. And then we'll, we'll have some final reflections um, from Jerry Minders there at the end. Um, so hopefully a, hopefully a very uh, a useful agenda um, for you today. We will be asking our um, panellists to, to keep their presentations quite short today um, so that we can make sure we have time for a, a really good discussion in the Q&A at the end. So please do share your questions with us in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And then just the next slide, um, just to, to show you who our speakers are, are today. Um, so we're grateful to be joined by Diane um, from International Disability Alliance and GLAD will be our opening speaker. Then we'll hear from Sean um, Tesney at CBM and, and um, oh sorry that's a typo there, it should say IDDC. Um, we'll be joined by Julia um, from IDDC Chair as well in Humanity and Inclusion. Then we'll hear from Subeksha from Humanity and Inclusion in Nepal. Will Clerman from Ekitabu, um, working um, in a range of contexts in East Africa and based in Kenya, um, and Ben Valiad from Save the Children in Kosovo. And lastly, Jerry will share some final reflections. Um, so apologies for the typo there, Sean. It just gives you a sense of the speakers. Um, Hey, but without further ado, I'm, I'm so grateful to um, Diane Rickler to be able to join us today and um, to start with sort of some opening reflections and considerations for us. Thank you, Diane. Over to you. Thank you. Just trying to get my video to start. Can you tell me if You're my... We can see you well. You can? Okay, great. Um, so first of all, a huge thank you uh, from GLAD and the IDA to the INEE for organizing this and fabulous to see how many people are participating. Um, often, you know, it's been recognized that even at the best of times, students with disabilities are um, the most neglected from education. And uh, so during this and, and often in times of crisis, those who are uh, at the back of the line get pushed further and further back. But it's really wonderful to see um, the support from INEE and from all of you who've joined today. Um, we've really been struck by um, the consciousness on the part of so many people working on the ground about the need to ensure safe, equitable and inclusive education um, with a focus now on distance learning while schools are closed. And countries are also asking what the best way is to support parents and teachers um, as they cope with their new roles with uh, the balance uh, out of kilter in terms of their own work and having their children at home. And um, you know, the, the fact that we're having this webinar is a recognition that um, there are, the best guess is 150 million um, people, um, children, people with disabilities and who are disproportionately impacted by what's going on. And we're particularly concerned that those who are most marginalized often from education um, is because their own families don't always recognize and others in the community don't recognize the benefits of making sure that those children have access to education. What we're trying to do though, is not to get um, mired in uh, doom and gloom, but to think about the opportunities that present themselves right now. And the three main benefits, uh, the three main opportunities that we see in terms of uh, potential now 
are the opportunities to increase stability and routine for learners, the opportunities to increase access for students who've never attended school, and the opportunities to increase um, equity and inclusion. And if I could just say a couple of words about each of those. Um, I mean, first of all, in terms of stability and routine, um, all those involved in education know that routines can provide structure and a sense of safety that can improve learning outcomes. And uh, having so much focus on uh, distance learning gives us an, a chance to work with parents, teachers, and support specialists to try to increase the stability and routine uh, for all learners, including those with disabilities. In terms of increased access, um, the investment in distance learning provides us with an opportunity to reach out of school children, even those who did not have access to education before the pandemic, uh, for reasons such as disability, geography, socioeconomic status, gender, and other marginalized identities. And this really gives us an opportunity for to future disruptions to the education system and to make sure that educational materials and training are being developed in ways that will be inclusive. And in terms of opportunities to increase equity and inclusion, um, what we've seen as material is being gathered is that much uh, of the work on distance learning does not really take equity and inclusion into account. And certainly those who are most at risk of falling further behind are those who are deaf, have visual disabilities, deaf blind, uh, psychosocial or intellectual disabilities. But uh, we don't want to miss the opportunity to make equity and inclusion part of uh, the bedrock of distance learning, especially as new platforms are developed. And in order to develop high quality distance learning um, content, there are two important things that we think need to be remembered. The first is the design of the content and platforms. And um, especially important is promoting platforms and content which integrate the principles of universal design for learning in providing multiple means of presenting information. Um, so that students can access edu education through a wide variety of technology. And this is a way, a focus on universal design for learning is a way to improve the quality of education for all. Um, there will be in the materials that you receive a link to um, uh, a site that provides examples of using ICT to implement universal design for learning. So in terms of content, first is the platforms, but then also representation. And while developing new content, we need to take advantage of the opportunity to include characters that represent the full range of human diversity, age, disability, sex, gender identity, ethnicity, and other minority populations. Um, and this can really help us to advance global efforts towards greater gender equality and inclusiveness in education. I really want to underline the fact that when well done, equitable and inclusive distance learning can improve the quality of education for all children, whether they're marginalized or, or not. And we encourage you to think about equity and inclusion as foundational pieces in the design of any COVID education response and to review the equity and inclusion uh, related resources that we'll be providing at the end of the webinar. Um, I just want to make sure that you know uh, on whose behalf I'm, I'm speaking today. Um, the, I am the co-chair representing the IDA uh, of the Inclusive Education uh, Working Group of the GLAD Network, together with Hannah from the World Bank. And the GLAD um, network is a coalition of uh, uh, bilateral and multilateral donors, as well as uh, foundations, the private sector, and um, organizations working in the area of disability. And our inclusive education working group is currently um, working to put together 
uh, materials and to provide some guidance in how best to make sure that actions taken uh, during this pandemic um, are inclusive. Um, we're pooling our resources and knowledge and we've already pulled together a literature review. We have some uh, guidelines on what inclusive education looks like. We have an infographic that's available in English, French, Spanish, uh, Arabic and Russian and encourage all of you to get a hold of that. And um, we look forward to further collaboration with INEE in order to um, uh, um, make sure that learners with disabilities are included in approaches to education during this pandemic. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from the other panelists in terms of what's happening on the ground and to see how we can further cooperate. And I'll just note that um, a link to our resources has already been posted in the, uh, in the chat. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Diane. Really powerful words for us there. Um, Hannah, if you could just move to the next slide um, and just to, to reassure everybody that, yeah, those links have been shared and will be shared also after the webinar. Um, so yeah, thank you for those powerful words to begin today, Dan. Um, I am conscious of time, so I'm just going to swiftly hand over to Sean now. Um, thank you for joining us, Sean. Sean's going to speak to another uh, useful resource, particularly in advocacy efforts um, from the IDDC. So over to you, Sean. Hello there, good morning, good afternoon and good evening, where, wherever you are. Um, it's a great pleasure to join uh, the webinar today and thank you Diane for that uh, inspiring beginning to the talk and uh, thank you to INEE for organising this um, opportunity for everyone. Um, just before I continue, am I supposed to be seeing my slides? Yeah, just say next. Okay. Just say next slide, Sean, when you need. The okay, next slide. next slide. Okay, sorry. Can I just make the screen? I don't want to see myself. I want to see the slides. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm here today. Um, my name is Sean Tesney. I work with CBM as a global advisor for education. But as uh, was said at the beginning, I also co-coordinate the. In, um, International Disability and Development Consortium Inclusive Education Task Group, along with Julia, the next uh, speaker. Next slide, please. Just in case you are not too familiar with um, IDDC, the International Disability and Development Consortium, I've put a little link there to the um, website. But in brief, it's an international network of around 31 civil society organizations from mainstream and, and uh, disability uh, focused um, organizations um, in the international development sector and humanitarian action sector with a special focus on the full and effective enjoyment of human rights of people with disabilities. Next slide. What does the Inclusive Education Task Group do? Well, it inputs, develops, and disseminates a range of information, as Diane mentioned there, through the GLAD Inclusive Education Working Group, we were able to support the infographic on inclusive education. And there's a, 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 um, a couple of clips there, very small, I'm afraid, of the infographic, but well worth downloading and getting your hands on uh, if you're looking for good guidance on inclusive education. A lot of the work is around advocacy to uh, ensuring that the global partnership for education, for example, um, through the global campaign for education and uh, ECW, Education Cannot Wait grants are um, ensuring the inclusion of all people, including children with disabilities in their grant processes. We input into documents and do research support. Um, more recently, we had the costing equity research about disability inclusive education. Uh, currently, um, the Light for the World are leading on uh, the um, uh, early childhood development research and costing of early childhood development. We've also been uh, very involved in supporting the next global education monitoring report on equity and inclusion. And we're members of uh, the GLAD Inclusive Education Working Group, the IDA Working Group on Inclusive Education, the GEM Advocacy Team, and part of the um, 
Technical Advisory Committee to the World Bank. Next slide. I want to go on to uh, through my presentation so that you can ask more questions at the end in relation to maybe practical um, solutions because as uh, Diane very eloquently pointed out um, uh, there are particular issues not only for children with disabilities but all children at this time but our focus is on children with disabilities um, and there are many innovative and, and quite heartwarming uh, solutions that partners are finding even at this particularly um, challenging and frightening time in the world that we live in. Well, in response to the COVID-19 situation, uh, the IDDC Inclusive Education Task Group brought got together to write this um, response and the link to the full response will be there um, on, on, on the link that will be shared I assume at the end of this session. Next slide please. I hope there's a next slide. <laughs> if not I can, oh, let me just, is there a problem with the next slide? Um, Charlotte or shall I revert to my own? We can see it Sean so if you keep going we can see the slides. Okay, yeah. uh, okay now I can see it. <laughs> I couldn't see it. So I just wanted to um, look at some key messages from the from the um, response. Um, can, sorry can you go back one slide please? As Diane pointed out, that, you know there are 150 million people with disabilities, in, um, possibly um, affected by COVID-19. Um, but in terms of, we knew already before the this um, the COVID-19 hit the world that at least 50% of out-of-school children in low and middle-income countries um, included children with children with disabilities. Very often they were amongst the, the poorest families, um, uh, amongst the, peop uh, the, the, the population of children with disabilities we knew were, were amongst the highest in terms of dropout rates and very often once dropping out of education would not return to education. And yes, technology is a solution for the future, and, but we have to ensure is there access for all? And I don't want to repeat what um, Diane said, but some of our partners are reporting, you know, intermittent internet, um, access is limited at the moment and needs planning, it needs expertise, but has huge potential. And certainly many of our partners are already um, using uh, technology to great benefit and are already looking towards the future and adopting the universal design for learning approach. Access to smartphones is limited, but still, again, we are finding, you know, the families may get together. One person has a smartphone and families are having, getting their children together to learn together through um, smartphones that are available. But school is much more than education. For many children, it's the one meal a day that they get and that they have their nutrition uh, for their um, for their life. So at this time, it's very concerning that poor families may not be getting access to food. It's where they access health. Many children with disabilities have other uh, underlying conditions which require additional health need, uh, health support needs. It's where children will feel safe, and certainly children, many children at risk, are reported at the moment to not be safe. To, to be at risk of abuse, to be, um, to be uh, part of child labor, even if it's within the home, or maybe caregiving within the home, looking after elderly relatives and so on. So we need to ensure that we focus on these um, situations and key messages as we not only during this pandemic, but also post this pandemic and look to see post-pandemic that we have a true opportunity to change the education system and truly be um, using universal design for learning for all children. Next slide please. So what are we asking governments and uh, international development actors to uh, ensure as we go forward? 
that children and young people most impacted are prioritised in this response and of course for us looking at those children with disabilities. That alternative education provision is accessible, reasonable accommodations are catered for and based on individual need. That there is adequate financing for inclusive education during and after the COVID outbreak. Disability inclusion should be mandatory for qualifying for GPE, ECW and so on. Technology and media for learning is in a variety of accessible formats need to be in place. Specialist support to children with disabilities should be given special dispensation to operate during lockdown periods. And I've seen some really interesting um, ways that uh, um, how, how um, therapy uh, rehabilitation is delivered via technology and seeing parents um, taking this on board themselves. And I, I'm really quite excited about that opportunity for the future. Responses are coordinated and cross-sectoral. Civil society, including organizations of, of people with disabilities, are consulted along with their parents. The voices of children and young people with disabilities are heard and involved in designing and implementation to response plans. Teachers and educators need to be secure that their um, salaries are paid for during this transition, that they are trained to, to manage this new way of educating. And specific actions are taken to ensure that the most marginalized children are effectively included and supported in their return to school when they do reopen. Thank you very much. That was quite fast, I, and, but I hope to speak to you later. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sean, um, and some yeah, really important advocacy messages um, that I'm sure many, many on the webinar um, can use in their, their own work and own advocacy efforts. And again, we'll, we'll share the, um, the links to all of these, these resources that are available. And again, just to thank our colleagues at GLAD and the IDDC for supporting the planning for this webinar. Um, so again, I'm going to move quickly on. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Julia at Handicap International, who also um, co-chairs the I, um, IDDC, um, because um, Julia's going to share with us some um, really practical examples of what programming can look like at this time. And I know I see many of the questions coming in are about that. So really excited for Julia to share these examples examples around distance learning and support to teachers and support to caregivers um, and um, um, yeah we'll uh, we'll also share again these these resources which are available on the INE website in our resource collection but Julia over to you. Thanks very much Charlotte and um, hope you can hear me all right um, yes yeah, so thanks uh, again huge thanks for INE for the opportunity I won't uh, go too much on that but it, it is a great opportunity to, to, to talk to you all together um, about this really important issue. Um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, so I work for Humanity and Inclusion, used to be Handicap International, and um, this, this presentation is more about practical, um, tangible actions that are taking place currently in, in some of our projects around the world. Um, next slide, please, if it moves on. Oh, <laughs> it's having some... Uh, ah, there you go. Um, so what I wanted to talk about... Um, initially was this idea of the twin track approach um, it was alluded to a little bit um, when Diane started talking about the fact that um, we need to make sure that all mainstream education approaches are inclusive of all children um, so an example being the you know education cluster um, response plans or contingency plans should be disability inclusive but on the other hand or on the other track we need to make sure that we are looking at specific needs um, for, uh, for children and that might be different sometimes so we might need to have alternative teaching approaches or modalities so that all children can can access education um, and i'm going to go through that in a bit more detail as we go through what i wanted to do was essentially um we've developed some really basic 10 top tips style briefs which are now on the INEE website um, which these are hyperlinked to so when you receive the pack you, you'll be able to go straight to them and they're in the themes of, of inclusive digital learning teacher resources and home-based learning so I'll move straight on to the inclusive digital learning which is the next slide it seems to <laughs> have a 
flip every time. So basically, I'm sharing just a screenshot of, of a couple of the tips. It's, there's, there's 10, so these are just two. Um, this is also, by the way, it does have an alternative text for people who use screen readers. So if they want to look at the presentation, you will be able to read the um, text and look at the text uh, and the diagrams using a um, alternative text, which is, uh, I'm also highlighting that point to say that we tried to make sure that all digital um, resources are accessible for, for people who are using um, screen reader technology and or voice, voice output technology. Um, admittedly, that's in more in a high tech environment. So um, in terms of the practical application, so the first point is about the use of, of free online lessons in core subjects um, to supplement core curriculums. What we've tried to do is to look at, there are you know, a whole raft of these available. Many uh, organizations have done huge compilations, which was actually mentioned recently on another INEE webinar about um, you know, UNESCO's compilation of dig distance learning, for example, and many others. Uh, we, we tried to look through those and just pinpoint ones that maybe have some more access accessibility features so um, perhaps have for example um, uh, the global digital library might have some things that have um, sign language interpret um, videos or there's sort of audio books and different um, resources on that on some of these um, you know uh, free online lessons that are more accessible to learners who have different uh, needs and different ways of learning. And the second point here is about free resources to print out for home-based learning so that we can still use distance learning materials and then maybe some, some people have access to that, but maybe not the people at home, but we can still make use of these resources in order to print off some materials and, and make some packs that we could then send home. So it's a kind of ways of working with digital learning so that it's not necessarily everybody has to have their own device or tablet in their home, which might not be possible. Can you go to the next slide, please? And then I'll share with you some <laughs> examples of, of how some of our teams are using those principles of using digital learning. So in Gaza, um, and I see somebody on, on the line who's, who's, who also could speak to that later if there's questions, um, they have been developing videos of interactive and fun lessons created using local smartphones by teachers using that sign language because they are um, teachers trained in, in sign language and inclusive teaching techniques. So lots of concrete materials using, you know, motivating um, ways of, 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 of teaching with uh, using play-based techniques. Going back to Diane's point about universal design for learning, where we have to use many different ways of presenting material to keep children's um, engagement. So that's hopefully a way of share it, sharing that on video that they've uploaded to a YouTube channel, which is uh, open access and the link is there. So you can see it's in Arabic. So not, you know, but you can see how they've done it, even if you're not understanding Arabic, but it's one example. The second is from Rwanda, where they're providing technical support to Rwanda and Education Board and its partners in the development of radio and TV lessons, uh, which is something many, many, you know, um, governments are doing. Um, Ministries of Education are, are doing that. Um, but um, what they're trying to do is make sure it's using inclusive approaches. So again, the principles of, of um, inclusive education, so making sure that it's at the right pace, making sure that it, um, all children are, are going to understand the material, that um, you know, there's plenty of repetition, and also um, there's a focus on making sure the sign language interpretation on the TV lessons as well. So those are some of those. Again, we have somebody hopefully on the line who can talk more on that um, from Rwanda. And Lebanon, I something with the, um, the slides went a bit strange. <laughs> so you hopefully get it in your pack. But they've also been using more of the, the free websites that are available, sharing that with their partners, promoting that amongst the, the students who do have access to, to digital learning. And they're also doing a lot with Zoom and trying to get teachers to um, train um, uh, to talk connect with others to, to be able to connect both to their students and also to each other um, to, to basically improve um, their have a kind of connection um, amongst each other so that they enables to enhance their their sort of difficulties during this time so they're not isolated and alone and they've also um, on the the pack you'll receive there's also a link to a recent e-conference which took place there um, on specific um, tips to support children with learning difficulties um, with distance learning so that that will be a, a useful link as well um, could you go to the next slide please 
it seems to have jumped a bit so some of them might not okay that's fine um so the next uh, area is teacher resources um i don't want to take too too long on this so i won't that this is a, a lot of text but it's just to share a screenshot of some of the tips Crucial things are to make sure you still check on the well-being of the children at home and have that link between parents and teachers. And also this idea of having small groups of learners who might have specific needs that can still get together um, even during the school closures. If you move to the next slide, because I'm conscious of not taking too much time, um, Charlotte, um, I wanted to give some examples of how some of our teams have been using those principles of, of getting the teachers closer to the children, be it through using their phone, be it through um, sending materials and also through different um, outreach workers. So in Egypt, they have been um, developing short lessons and fun quizzes um, using WhatsApp groups um, to, to connect with children, many, many of whom that's a possibility, even if they don't have tablets or, or other um, you know, more, more, let's say, sophisticated um, equipment. And they're also sending learning packs home with, with messages around COVID-19 and, and what, you know, how they can, what, what they need to do, but also, you know, motivating activities, um, not just a series of more boring <laughs> lesson content, but it's, it's the idea is to make it as, as fun and engaging as possible, uh, following it up with phone calls. Um, and these, also in Egypt and Kenya, these are also with the refugee population, just to point out. And in Kenya, in Kakuma, they have been, um, because they have classroom assistants in some of the um, schools that we're working in, those classroom assistants have been sort of uh, changed their place of work to now supporting in the home, but they're supporting um, by teachers, are supporting them to be able to deliver that learning at home with a distance, so following social distancing rules, but being able to assist with home learning and linking to existing community-based workers who already visit those families. Um, again, I think the slides have shifted a bit, but hopefully in your pack, you'll see them in the right. So it, it will be able to get all the information and the links. Um, I'll move on to the final set of examples. And obviously please, um, ask questions um, at the end. These are just really short little clips of, of, of various different contexts where we're doing things. And for the home-based learning, um, two things I wanted to highlight. The importance of routines. It's actually interesting um, that um, um, the, uh, the route, uh, you know, Diane mentioned about the routines earlier on. I mean, stretching the day with learning and leisure activities such as routines can really help children to feel more secure. Um, visual pictograms and symbols and even hand-drawn simple picture can really help children to understand what's happening in their day and what's familiar with them. Um, and also this idea of coping with stress, um, to try to reduce a child's level of stress by talking with them in a calm manner and adapted to his and her you know um un level of understanding i think we wanted to include something in this around you know making sure it's sort of the, the psychosocial elements of this so it's not just about academics it's also about what the children are feeling and going through it's a difficult time for all of us making sure they're under you know it being explained the situation's being explained to them well so that's why that's what in included in the, in the top tips there. Um, so if, if you move to the, the final slide, um, it's just to say some examples of how we're connecting with parents really through different community-based initiatives within a country level. So um, learning from the Ebola crisis, the teams in Sierra Leone already have some experience of having to have you know, school closures for a whole year in that case. So they had some experience of community-based rehabilitation volunteers um, supporting small groups of learners to access radio lessons um, by supporting them in small groups. Um, and um, this time around, it's more difficult to do, you know, larger groups because of the rules, but they're trying to do it more small individual at the moment, individual home visits. But the, the idea is that when radio is up and running, hopefully a similar thing could happen um, where so because children with disabilities quite often oh, many children find it hard to just listen to a radio um, lesson and, and you know concentrate and, and be able to then follow to actually um, answer the questions and, and understand all the content without some support so that's something that we have had a, in the past um, learning from and then finally Uganda that we, I just wanted to add some examples of learning through play and the importance of learning through play and using local materials because what we're trying to say is there's a many, you know, materials that don't need any money, you know, 
uh, just local materials that people have around, especially in the early years, that they could use to develop home-based learning, be it through using sand and sticks and counting with, you know, um, little pebbles it, it could doesn't matter as long as you have the ideas to to share with people and and that can really do a long do a lot of good in terms of moving moving them on um, it's a bit of a whistle stop tour i just wanted to give some examples um, but for a much fuller um, example of, of the whole raft of things that are going on at one country level that I'll, I'll hand over to my colleague for that i'm sorry about the fast i was very conscious of the um, the time frame that's why apologies to lydia um, for that one. <laughs> I'd see your point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. Um, and thank you for, for sharing the resources. Just to remind everyone, we do have the COVID-19 resource collection on the INE website and these top tip sheets that Julia has, has given us a, a quick tour of, they are all available there. Um, so thanks, Julia, for an overview of those top tips and these practical examples, I think very helpful for our um, attendees. We do see these questions coming in. We are seeing them and recording them and we'll get to them in the, the Q&A. Um, but I'm actually going to hand over now so that we can hear more of these practical examples from a range of country contexts. So um, Hannah, we can stop showing the, the presentation and, I'll, and we'll hand over to Subeksha, um, who's going to just share a little bit more about the work she's doing in Nepal. Um, thanks for joining us. Subeksha, if you want to come on yeah. video and off mute, that'd be yeah. great. Thank is, it, you. is it fine? Yeah. Uh, hi all, I'm Subeksha Karki and I'm working as an inclusive education technical advisor at HI Nepal. So I'd like to thank um, INEE for providing the opportunity to share some of the initiative that um, we have been doing in HI uh, and supporting Nepal government. So at the federal level, uh, the government of Nepal is putting in place a series of measures to address the situation. And the government of Nepal has formed a committee to coordinate the preparedness and response efforts. So under Education Cluster, Government of Nepal has developed contingency and response plan with the objective to prevent the spread of COVID-19 from education institution by ensuring a safe learning environment. So as a member of Education Cluster, HI Nepal have been providing technical inputs and feedback in the education contingency plan. And then we are also ensuring that these activities and plans developed by Ministry of Education, Science and Technology are accessible as well as those plan uh, address the need of children with disabilities. Uh, so as a part of support of the um, in initiation uh, 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 developed by the education cluster, HI Nepal has also developed the educational public service announcement to support families of children with disabilities, which is being broadcasted to national radios and local FM stations. Uh, through this PSA, families of children with disabilities will know that they could also support their children in educational activities such as games, story, telling, poems, educational song, and then engaging them, their children in some exercise if it's possible, when those children are not going to school and then they are staying at home. So we are also working with consortium partner to identify the accessibility of learning packages developed um, by Ministry of Education, Science and Technology for targeting early grade uh, readers. And then we are analyzing the gaps as well as providing like uh, the recommendation. So basically we are ensuring that this materials like package of the learning materials is uh, our, uh, like our, with the laser font, they are like easy read. Uh, they are available in the Braille and then some storybooks are also available in sign language. So we were also planning to provide a list of free supplementary online education uh, so that it could support um, children learning. So these are the basically the uh, like federal level activity or the uh, education cluster activity that HI Nepal is supporting. Uh, in terms of community level activity, where like currently during the lockdown period, uh, the moment uh, is not possible because we are supporting through distance support through telephone to our target beneficiary in one of the project implementing area. So uh, basically we have provided the virtual training, share the learning materials or the material developed by HI to the community mobilizer who have then uh, trained the volunteer. Basically we call the volunteer as big sisters uh, so that they can support on daily basis as well as need based support to children with disabilities and their families. Uh, this, um, uh, this community mobilizes and volunteer they meet uh, like they have the virtual meeting every week where they 
uh, they are updated about the current situation and as well as they share their own experiences with each others. Uh, these volunteers are also providing this uh, distance support to parents and caregivers of children with disability to ensure that this pro proper care as well as their, uh, their parents are supporting uh, through, the, uh, through the education or learning um, of their children. So sometimes, like in, uh, in addition to this, they are also providing the psychosocial support to the families of children with disability uh, whenever required through telephone. So the volunteers are also providing some suggestion to the parents, like um, basically targeting for the educational games like counting stick, uh, tracing letter in sand, matching games with hand-drawn pictures, word, etc. So we are also planning once the lockdown is uh, like uh, lifted and if some movement al al are allowed, so this volunteer will do the home visit and also support like provide the support to parents to develop the low cost or very like um, uh, low cost materials uh, using the local resources like uh, vocabulary card, tactile alphabet or the visual timetable and so on. So thank you so much for listening and I look forward for the interaction with you all. Thanks. Thank you so much um, for joining us today from Nepal. It was just so helpful and, and powerful to hear about those examples. Um, so thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to hearing more in the Q&A. I can already see comments in thanking you for, for such a great um, presentation. So thank you, um, Subeksha. I'm now going to hand over um, to another example. Um, Hannah, if we could bring the slides up again. Um, from Ekitabu, based in Kenya. Um, Will joins us today. We're again, going to give a perspective from, from their work in Kenya, but um, also East Africa more, more broadly. Um, thanks for joining us today. Well, over to you. Okay, thank you, Charlotte. And th well, thanks, Charlotte. And also thank you, Josh Joseph, for including me in this. I'm learning a lot. I'm really happy to hear the, the voices and the ideas of, of people whose work I've seen before and, and greatly appreciate. Um, so now having heard the context a bit, I also, um, I, I think I can, <laughs> I think I can figure out how best to use the, the five minutes that, that we have here. Um, and I want to keep the time if I can. So I want to, I'll say up front that what you, what, what we'll talk about here are Ikitabu response with partners um, on the ground in East Africa, focused on Kenya, but also working in Rwanda and other countries. So um, our, in, in everything that we do, Ikitabu focuses on accessible digital content for inclusive and quality education. Um, the particular concepts that we're, 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 we're working on exploring with partners in COVID-19 response focus on curriculum differentiation using low-cost accessible digital technologies. I mean, it, our, our understanding, and it was great to hear Diane speak at the outset, also the comments that Julia made as well, um, and, and Sean, of course, just, just these, the, the, the focus on universal design for learning. I mean, our, our simple understanding that I think is probably shared by most people on this call is that when your building is designed for people on the margins, your building works better for everyone. That's, that's the focus that we bring to the work that we do that mainly revolves around accessible teaching and learning materials. So in that context and in our COVID-19 response, the question that we're asking, the question that we're digging into in the work that we're doing and with partners, in particular with Leonard Cheshire in, in Kenya under Diffid's Girls Education Challenge is how and to what extent can digital technology improve learning outcomes for children with disabilities and professional development for teachers? A, in the short term while schools are closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic and B, in the longer term when schools reopen, including the potential role of school systems in COVID-19 testing. So I, I'm, I'm reading that to you because that's a formulation that we've been working on to build evidence of what works in answering this question. So please go to the next slide. Thank you. The Ikitabu response elements um, focus first of all on the broadcast information in local sign language. Um, and this is for television as well as radio. This is video as well as audio connected to online learning resources, open educational content that we have posted um, both from public sector sources as well as from private sector publishers who are responding to the COVID-19 pandemic by making their, their copyrighted materials available for free online access during the pandemic. So those are all, we've posted those all over a hundred of them up to now 
and more every day on open.ikitabu.com. Um, we've also accelerated production work that we were doing in uh, a project that we've been doing the past two years with support from, uh, from All Children Reading and, and USAID. That's called Digital Storytime. So Digital Storytime is a packaging of local sign language videos uh, that we produce in Studio KSL. KSL is Kenyan Sign Language. We produce Digital Storytime now and we're broadcasting it five days a week in support of the government of Kenya's distance learning efforts with children, as they say, who are contained in the home. Digital Storytime is, is, has now been, uh, this may be news to, to, <laughs> to some people on the call, including Josh, but we've just learned that KICD is so happy with the material and the feedback that they've gotten that they are now talking about mainstreaming this storytelling in Kenyan Sign Language for the mainstream curriculum with all children. Um, I, I guess just go to the next slide and we'll, we'll talk about that there quickly. So this is just a screenshot of what's up on open.ikitabu. Um, you can see that there, there are many stories from our partner African Storybook here that are all open educational resources. This is from uh, last week. Oxford University Press has now committed to put their materials up online for free. All of these materials are in accessible EPUB format, um, both for use with screen readers um, and s some of them, not all of them, contain the sign language video that we have built into the EPUBs and posted to the Global Digital Library. Next slide, please. So Ikitabu Digital Storytime, uh, this is the splash screen that shows up on Kenyan television now twice a day, five days a week. Next slide, please. So in, in Digital Storytime, it's three episodes, well, three, three stories per episode of the, the, the Kenyan Sign Language video storybooks that we've been producing for the past two years. When KICD reached out to us and asked us for accessible content that we could, we could mobilize that we could deliver very quickly for them to broadcast on the Edu channel. Um, we, we, we accelerated work we were doing in Studio KSL to package up those Kenyan Sign Language videos. All these stories, the, 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 the woman you're looking at there, she is a deaf Kenyan signer. All the stories are signed by, uh, in Kenyan Sign Language by deaf Kenyan signers. Um, and they're, they're led by uh, the director of our Studio KSL, who is a deaf, a deaf educator herself, Georgina Uma. Some people on the call may know her. Georgine um, is a teacher, uh, a certified teacher in Kenya, and she is the one who is helping us to make sure that the Kenyan sign language, the local sign language that goes into every storybook that we produce is correct, accurate, and even respects regional variations in local sign language. Next slide, please. Um, the, the format is, is straightforward. I, I guess I'll, I'll, to conserve time, I won't go into the, the depth of that, but you can at least see how the story, it's another example on the bottom of the screen on the left of how one of these storybooks works. Each of the storybooks has not only the signer who is the storyteller and the, the background, but also um, captions as well as audio and music for hearing children. Feedback that we're getting now is that children who have deaf, sorry, families who have deaf children and hearing children are having the hearing children and the deaf children watching the stories together, practicing their sign language together, and everyone, all of the children, are enjoying the stories greatly. So that's at least the, the positive feedback we're getting. And KICD has now asked us to produce 20 more episodes um, so that we can deliver those for, for inclusion in the mainstream programming that KIC do, KICD does daily during prime time, so that they're opening up a second slot for Kenyan Sign Language storytelling on television, and this is something entirely new. Um, next slide, please. Um, I won't spend any time on this. This is just here because all of the materials are connected to online lear learning resources in the cloud. Next, please. Um, so, so this is so in, in the work that we're doing, not just in digital story time, but also um, um, broadly with partners, including, as I mentioned, with Leonard Cheshire, the focus is on first and foremost on accessibility, accessibility of the teaching and learning materials. Um, in, and our main focus is materials that can be delivered for quality education with government approval 
rapidly. So that means focus, we focus first on materials that are approved for the local curriculum, whether they're from public sector or private sector, um, and the accessibility that we bring to those materials focuses on, on these different formats, output in electronic braille or for print braille, out, um, in, embedded audio, whether it's human narrated or using text-to-speech rendering with screen readers. Um, the video, I've already shown you some quick examples. Interactivity, we build interactive materials into the content when we digitize it um, and connect that to learning analytics. That's something that ministries of education are particularly excited about. Um, and it's something that um, we, we, we have to bring to them because that's, that's something that seems to motivate them strongly. Um, I, I won't spend any more time on these, but, but I, I will say that some of the most exciting work that we're doing, even right now in, in COVID-19 response, focuses on children with intellectual disabilities. I've mentioned the deaf, but also children with intellectual disabilities. The Leonard Cheshire team in Western Kenya has been, has been very focused on the fact that children with intellectual disabilities, as well as children with hearing impairments, are frequently the most marginalized of all. And working with, working with their team, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, great. So I guess, oh, no, no, not that one, yep. Uh, looks like this slide is a little bit big for the display, but that's okay. Um, the, the, um, yeah, so the, the focus back to the, the concept of UDL, the focus on different curriculum differentiation for, well, for, ch for all children, meaning meeting the child where the child is, meeting the learner with the different abilities and disabilities that that learner has. That's the focus of what we're doing to support teachers right now in while schools are closed. We are doing what we can through broadcast means, um, not just television and not just radio, but also through phone and WhatsApp support and SMS to children and families in their homes. But the teachers who are in the projects where we work, some of those teachers have stayed in active communication with us and our partners. And, we're, and the focus, our focus is on how can we best support those teachers while the schools are closed to build capacity with those teachers, even to build their skills. For example, in, in uh, a, a quick, quick short example here, um, we found that in, in, in instruction in Braille, our biggest challenge is the Braille skills of the teachers. If we want the children to learn Braille, then it's vital that the teachers have Braille skills themselves. So with the Leonard Cheshire team, we're focused on how do we, how do we accelerate the teacher's understanding and, and facility with Braille so that when those teachers return to the school, they can help the children to use the Braille and to access the materials in Braille better. The teachers are a, a, critical, a, a critical priority for us, especially while schools are closed. So maybe I will just wrap up there so that there's time for the questions. Um, Charlotte, shall I hand it back to you? Thanks, Will, and, and thanks so much for the presentation. Um, and you can see in the comments how helpful people have found it. Um, so really appreciate you sharing, um, sharing these examples with us, um, as well as resources that um, participants can access. So yeah, look forward to hearing more in the Q&A. Um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, in the interest of time, I'm going to quickly hand over um, to our, our next sort of example, um, practical example, um, this time from, from Kosovo. So, Hannah, if we, if we close the, the presentation um, and let uh, welcome Valid, and Valid, if you could put your um, video on so people can see you um, and just share some of the work you've been doing um, in Kosovo. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte, and um, thank you to INEE for the opportunity. So um, I'm, I'm Valis Rubi, I'm working for uh, Save the Children International country office in Kosovo. And um, I will briefly uh, present uh, the work we are doing to support distance learning of uh, children with disabilities during the COVID-19. So uh, starting from the first uh, case we had with the infection in, 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 in the country, uh, the schools were closed by the government in uh, mid of March and uh, right after uh, the Ministry of Education has started to provide um, TV lessons for primary, primary school children. But those lessons weren't uh, inclusive uh, to, to, to children with disabilities. So we started to, to kind of think and support the uh, distance learning of children with disabilities. 
So what we did was we started um, uh, to build a cooperation with the Ministry of Education and other service providers um, coming from resource centers, but also um, experts from the university and um, OPDs. So we started to build um, a website, which is an online platform where we uh, are posting, posting um, different uh, learning activities to be uh, implemented at home for children with disabilities. Um, the website is going to be launched uh, tomorrow and will be um, a starting point where uh, all, all children with disabilities will have the chance to um, implement uh, learning activities at home. So we see this as a platform as a very important tool, which will um, strengthen uh, the cooperation between the, the schools, parents, children, and everyone involved when it comes to uh, supporting the education of children with disabilities uh, during and beyond the COVID-19 um, lockdown, lockdown period. Um, a great, uh, uh, another great thing was that um, we have been uh, able to cooperate with uh, all stakeholders, including the Organization of Persons with Disabilities, when it comes to um, building and creating uh, different activities for learning activities for children with disabilities, which will be posted on, on the website. Um, the activities will be uh, inclusive to, to all children. So we will have um, activities for um, different types of disabilities, including uh, deaf children, also blind children, and so on. So the, the, that we are trying to make the, the, the website accessible to everyone. Uh, another thing we do is also to provide and dis, uh, distribute educational kits for children with disabilities. So we have uh, provided um, like uh, kits with uh, in educational toys, uh, didactic materials, uh, books, and so on, which will um, support the learning process of children with disabilities while at home. And um, at the same time, we have been collaborating with uh, support teachers and making sure that um, teachers are in uh, continuous uh, uh, contact with parents and instruct them how to how to implement activity, learning activities with children at home, but at the same time, how to use the educational toys we have, we have provided them with uh, to, to uh, implement um, activities. Um, another, another thing that we are doing during these times is also providing awareness raising uh, activities and uh, interventions to uh, families of children with disabilities and children with disabilities themselves. Um, majority of these interventions are being um, delivered in close cooperation with organizations of, organizations of persons with disabilities. And uh, for example, we have been advocating together with those DPOs to the government for subsidizing families of children with disabilities since um, those families have been left out of the emergency package of the government. But at the same time, we have been um, working together in organizing online information sessions for children with disabilities on how to protect themselves uh, from being infected. Um, these uh, sessions have been provided also in sign language. We have been uh, contracting local experts, as I said, uh, from the university. Uh, to carry out an uh, online session on stress and anxiety management for children with disabilities and their families during the lockdown, lockdown period. And at the same time, we have been providing awareness uh, online sessions for children with disabilities on COVID-19 and positive parenting using existing online groups and forums of parents that we have. So uh, more or less, this is um, what we are doing uh, these days. And if you have any question, I would be happy to answer. Thank you so much, Valer. I really appreciate hearing the, the range of activities 
you've been conducting there around this topic. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so we've reached reached the end of the, the presentations here and I know we've got a lot of questions coming in um, and we look forward to exploring those. Before we start the Q&A though, I'd just like to ask Jerry if you could, Jerry, come on um, video and off mic and if you don't mind keeping the reflections quite brief, Jerry, so we have time for the Q&A, um, but it would be great um, to, to get some reflections from you um, as we uh, as we move to the Q&A. Thank you so much for joining us today. Sure. Thank you, Charlotte. And um, thank you to INEE for modeling good practice by having this session on early in our response or global response to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I'll, I will be as brief as possible. I want to, I, I think we heard a lot of encouraging things from the panelists so far, and I want to thank them. I've been thanking Diane Richler for her candor and intellect for 20 years. And so um, thank you, Diane, for a couple of things. One, um, for saying that inclusion is about more than people, children with disabilities. It's about children with multiple barriers to education. Um, and historic barriers to education. I will say that I'm not maybe as optimistic as Diane. I want to thank um, Sean for a really good description of the challenge of the mention of survival needs of children with disabilities and um, the list of musts for governments and donors to, to follow. And then for all the practical examples given by our panelists. And I do have some concerns and I want to open with a a brief quote from someone I've never quoted before, and that is um, King Abdullah of Jordan. This crisis has thrown a harsh light on the gaps in our global order. Gaps caused by social injustice, income inequalities, poverty, and misgovernments. I think it's important to realize that um, children who've been historically excluded from education are not starting with an equal advantage or disadvantage um, as we address COVID-19 in our response. I participated in a discussion last week. Uh, I was an observer, but had a question and answer with one of the participants, a representative of a multilateral donor um, working in Africa. And the gentleman said that um, we, Collectively, governments and donors and implementers were not prepared for this crisis. Um, that we are grabbing on to often the first learning platforms we, within our reach, radio, television, maybe online learning, distribution of reading materials, and that these, these platforms are inherently um, inaccessible by significant segments of the population and that we and and he said at one point we and we need to over time address the needs of the most vulnerable and i took some issue with the phrase over time but i also understand the, the perspective that we have not invested in the architecture of inclusion in the education sector to a sufficient degree so that the tools, the skills, the platforms really don't exist to the scale that is needed at this point. Um, too much of our investments in education globally have, on inclusion have been on the margins of mainstream investment, global education activities. And so what I'm calling for is essentially the following. Um, we need to look at, as, as we respond to COVID-19, we need to look at what we measure as we adapt to this crisis. Who on each platform, radio, television, distance learning, online learning, who is being served by these platforms? But we need to intentionally measure who is not being reached by each of these platforms. Do girls have inadequate access to technology? People living in poverty, do they have radios? Um, are the, are the, the programming on radio and television and online learning being disseminated in minority languages? And of course, are children with disabilities with visual and hearing impairments able to access these different modalities of learning? We need to measure our failures as well as our successes. 
I think that's the only way. And why should we do this? Um, one, to be honest with ourselves and our citizens, to understand how the learning divide is widening and for whom, to prepare for the next pandemic. How can we have more inclusive approaches to learning built into our systems and to build back inclusive, to focus on those who are left behind as, as we open the doors to schools again, to, to consciously and intentionally address the divide that has been exacerbated the learning gap divide, the digital divide that has been exacerbated by this crisis. So, and, and, and in terms of the design phase, and I'm, I'm almost done, Charlotte, I see. Um, we, donors and governments need to have a seat at the table for those who have been marginalized historically and especially by this crisis. I'll, I'll end with a, another call for action. Two years ago in July, GIFID convened a summit of global on, dis on disability and development, which was really a game changer within the halls of many donor agencies, where the conversation previously was, why are we talking about this to how do we do it? I think we need another summit early on in the COVID-19 crisis that brings together global leaders to make sure that we do respond in an inclusive way and build back inclusively. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerry, for those powerful words. And I'd like to thank all the panelists today. I think it's um, been a, a range of really practical examples, but also really, really powerful messages that for us all to take forward, I think, in our work around this, this hugely important um, topic. So thanks to all of you. I'm actually going to ask all of you to now put your video on um, as we move to the Q&A. So we've just got about 20 minutes and there's been some great discussion happening in the chat and the question and answer box. So um, if, if all of our panelists could come on um, video. Um, and we'll we'll move to those questions, but a, but a huge thanks to all of you, and a huge thanks to everyone who submitted questions. Um, so I'll start with the first question. Um, is really been coming up throughout the the presentations today, and we know it's one that many, particularly in humanitarian contexts, a challenge people are facing when we talk about distance learning, and this is how we can provide this kind of support in really low resource, low tech, low connectivity environments. And you know, any, any suggestions for how we can conduct these activities in those contexts? Um, and also a you know, question suggestion around locally made materials. Um, Julia, I wondered if I could start with you um, with just some reflections about these, you know, these particularly challenging environments um, and then I'll open it to other panelists. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, Charlotte. And yeah, thanks everyone else. It's been a really inspiring set of speakers. Um, great to get all the all the ideas. Yeah, I think um, I've seen yeah, some of the questions around um, what about environments where we don't have access to technology? You know, we don't have access to all of these things. I mean, I think there's two things there going back to some of the other points around um, uh, what this means for advocacy, because actually our role is to to advocate for more you know for more investment and for more investment in technology um, distance learning specifically to support more vulnerable groups um, so that is something that you know is part of our advocacy to to increase that funding because there's a massive funding gap so that's something we should should be advocating for so the likes of the e wonderful presentation from will you know with Ekitab, wouldn't it be wonderful if that sort of thing was available to children in these different contexts there's no reason Reason. I mean, a lot of these things are offline, don't necessarily need um, technology, you know, to be connected to the internet the whole time. You just need to be able to have the actual devices that are loaded up with the relevant resources. So I think that's one, one thing to focus on. Um, but before you get to that point, clearly we're in a situation where a large majority of the kids that we're working with in it, up and down it, in all of these countries, you know, it's, it's very much low technology, low, low um, levels of resources. So really, it's those kinds of um, ideas where, as we were saying, you know, what can we do to still connect to parents? And actually, going back to Diane's original point, which I liked, is that 
yes, it's not an ideal situation at all, this, but maybe this is the sort of the opportunity to say, how can we connect more, more at the community level? Multi, we haven't really talked enough about the multi-sectorial approach, which was something I, meant to, I mentioned on a slide but didn't have a chance to say. And I really want to say it now because I think that the multi-sectorial approach is the way to address this issue of how to support children in a context of, of you know, limited resources, that there are other sectors going in to support children, especially children with disabilities, um, you know, in terms of mental health, in terms of protection, in terms of other, other sectors, other agencies, you know, nutrition, all the different that we know that there's many different sectors out there trying to support children who have different needs and are we talking to them is education going alongside those those services going in you know what can we do to join together we've almost used this as an opportunity to say oh actually you know the community workers are anyway going in to look at you know hygiene and other aspects around COVID so can we also go in and, and give some messages around how the parents can best be supporting their children's learning you know can't, can't we work together on this so I think that you know with simple things that were low cost materials or even just no materials but what could you do just together to, to promote learning by just reading together telling stories just things that are simple um, that you know uh, and then obviously with older children it's more challenging but I think that's the, the place to start so hopefully the, the tips are something we shared um, at the beginning and just as a reminder that is on the resource website because somebody asked in the chat box I noticed you know where can we get that so just to say it will be on the um, on the chat on the um, sorry on the link at the end um, probably talk great, too much but <laughs> no 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 great covered a few <laughs> questions in one uh, good no problem and yes all, the, all of these resources are on the INE website so you can find them there just any other panelists just on this kind of low tech low resource low connectivity question um, if any other panelists would like to jump in please do Yes, I, I wouldn't. I just, uh, just um, I, I had a meeting with a group of our education partners just on Friday, um, and I thought it was very interesting what what uh, solution that uh, a few of them had come up with in terms of getting um, uh, videos and train lessons to villages or to communities where there were no smartphones. And so yes, it's all very well having your training for your teachers on Zoom and delivering lessons on Zoom, but what, what happens about the other children who can't access um, those facilities? And um, they found a couple of, I thought, very innovative um, solutions where um, they mapped out, well, who in the village did have a smartphone or did have access to the internet. And that became a little hub, if you like, with. Um, social distancing uh, respected, that they ensured that when lessons were being or training was being provided on Zoom, that this was recorded and then the, um, the video was sent. And indeed, uh, parents who are teachers of children with disabilities were putting on like little lessons using low, low resources, home, um, home sort of uh, materials that they had in the house and how they were making them and showing parents how to make them and uh, delivering rehabilitation, delivering speech therapy through these kind of um, opportunities. Uh, so I think for sure there are possibilities out there and they then have gone into looking at and I will, will next our next meeting will probably bring this to the fore they're looking at now the tablets and I'm sure Will will can speak much more about that where you actually don't need connectivity so you need to get the information on the tablet to get it and provide it so that's the next step that they are looking at, at using technology but in a very low cost way um, and interestingly, uh, a state, Tamil Nadu, a state in, in India, has asked uh, CBM to help them tra trans translate, transfer all their online teaching materials and resources as an example for India and then pilot it there for, to make, ensure that everything is accessible. So because as has been said several times, if materials are accessible to children with disabilities, it will be accessible to all children. And, and I love the sign language example. I think, you know, a world where children will naturally learn to sign together from an early age will promote adults who will sign and not fear signing. So, uh, and this apparently will then be looked at um, 
uh, throughout India. So I think there are there there are examples, but there are huge challenges. I think what Jerry said is absolutely um, right. You know, we really do need to get global leaders. We need in country. You know, our advocacy has to include our district education officers, our ministers of education. We have to advocate for them to ha find. You know, yes, we have to reach the the least reach. But at the same time, we cannot ignore the advocacy that needs to go on. Um, that's Great. my contribution. Thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, really, really helpful additions there. Thank you both. Um, it's a, a question that's come up and again and again. So really appreciate those reflections and perhaps something we can all continue to explore together and share uh, more strategies for addressing. Julia, I'm conscious you mentioned sort of cross-sectoral collaboration. That's another question that, that's come up. And, so Beksha, I'm, I'm conscious you mentioned this in your work that um, sort of around intersectoral planning and we had a question just asking if you could speak a bit more about how you went about that, how you engaged um, other actors and other sectors. Could you speak a bit more about that? Mm. Hi all. So actually like um, for uh, under HI Nepal, we are working in different uh, like sector, whether it's like health, whether it's education, and different approach like livelihood and all those things. So basically like when we are like um, uh, disseminating the information related with the like pre prevention of or the awareness raising activities of COVID-19, not just related with the education. We also for, uh, make sure that those like uh, the volunteer, they like they communicate to the parents of children with disability that these type of information is being uh, shared. You need to listen to the radio or you need to like, and if there is anything uh, like relief packaging being distributed, uh, these volunteers like who are working for the education sector, they are also being engaged. Like we make sure that they, 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 know, they know that these relief packages are being like distributed and then these uh, uh, children with disabilities and the families are most vulnerable and they need to be aware and they need to be like, um, they need to get those uh, relief packages um, as soon as possible. So we are like, uh, through within our existing project, we are co collaborating with uh, each other so that each of these activities are not uh, like uh, doing in isolation, but rather than in collaboration with others thing. Great, thank you. Thank you for yeah sharing that. And I think we're hearing that in all of these webinars and all of our work around COVID-19, this is sort of an important time for us to be putting that intersectoral work into action. So appreciate the examples there. Um, thank you um, for that. Um, Diane, I just wondered if I could come back to you. We had um, a question or two around, you, made, you, you mentioned that distance learning could contribute to stability and routine. Um, and a couple of people have asked to hear a little bit more about that. Could you speak to that? Uh, sure. I think that, you know, one, one of the underlying themes uh, that comes through from every, everything that people are saying is the kind of disruption that's happening in, in homes and, and communities. And the, all, the disruption of routine really has such a negative impact on the ability of learners to uh, maintain the skills that they have and to, to acquire new ones. And so um, I think that for me, one of the key issues here is the importance of getting messages out to families that, um, you know, in, in inclusive education within a school context, we've learned that one of the ways to be really efficient is not to use the special expertise to support students, but rather to use the special expertise to support teachers so that they can teach. Right now, it's those families that need the support. So I think that um, it's really important to have strong messages going out to families about how routines can help them to manage what's going on at home. And I think the examples that Julia used in her tips really give some simple ways that families can learn to make a schedule and keep to a schedule and how that will help them to keep their children calm and, and comfortable. Um, and uh, regardless of the modality that's being used, I think that it's possible for families to schedule a few times in the day where the focus is really on, on education. And in the materials that are being um, shared through this webinar, um, there are some examples of how to apply um, a universal design for learning and an ICT toolkit. But some of the things that have been mentioned in terms of, you know, whether it's a radio broadcast in areas where that's available or television where that's available, 
or even if it's somebody in the community that has a device that they're able to share to make sure that that happens at a regular time, that it's not sporadic because it's the regularity that's going to really help the children to, um, to be able to feel secure. Thanks, Diane. Really appreciate, really appreciate that response. I'm now going to, to move to a question that's sort of around sort of this importance of advocacy efforts at the moment, um, but also kind of global efforts to coordinate around this. Um, so there's a question asking how sort of the global disability movement are coordinate, coordinating advocacy efforts, but in particular monitoring country response plans to ensure that um, disabled people in general and children with special needs in particular are not left behind. So um, I don't know, Sean or Julia, if you work with IDDC, if you could speak to any sort of that efforts, particularly around this monitoring piece, as there've been a few questions, uh, questions around that. I, mean, I would defer to Diane as representing IDA. There are several surveys going. This is the uh, survey. Yes, I was going to say. So maybe Diane as representing IDA, that would be good if you would. And a, and a survey for II, I, Diane, you could mention. Diane, you're still mention. on mute. You're on just... mute, Diane. Sorry, sorry. Um, Yes, we can circulate the questionnaires that are being circulated now by the World Bank's Inclusive Education Initiative. And in fact, there's going to be um, another meeting after this one of uh, some people working on that and we can make sure that the message from here goes out. Um, IDA is also trying to collect information and I can make that available to um, the people organizing this webinar so that it can be shared uh, with everybody. Um, USAID also has been gathering a tremendous amount of information um, and some of that is being made available through the GLAD network and we can make sure that you all get um, uh, the information on links to all of that material. Great, um, thanks so much Dan. I might just add as well, there's been a lot of work. I can see things popping up in the chat box about GPE and ECW. And then it just so there's been a, a collective effort in the, you know, the disability community, I guess to say, related to education, to make sure that the, the GPE and ECW are focus, do have a focus on um, children with disabilities and the ECW grants definitely do. Um, so there's all the education kind of way. And also the... Um, um, you have the GPE um, they, 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 to, to basically try and ensure that there's a focus on children, uh, at least a stipulation that children with disabilities need to be focused on within the GPE grants. They're just because there's been um, a big uh, 250 million um, provision just recently being announced. Okay, thanks so much, Julia. Yeah, no, really helpful. Um, thanks for flagging that. Um, I'm really conscious, everyone, that we're running running very um, short on time. Just a, a um, well, we've had a question around supporting teachers with sort of emergency rapid professional development. I know you spoke to that in your your presentation, yeah. but any any points you'd like to add in case we didn't have time to hear any, everything? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Charlotte. And and. Um, uh, let me see if I can connect a few dots and in, in questions that I've been hearing and, and things have been coming to mind and Julia's comments and Sean's and, and Diane's even. Um, so I was really happy to hear Jerry close with equity, close his remarks with, with equity. And it echoed what, what um, Diane had spoke about at the front regarding um, UDL as a, as a means to, to greater equity in education um, and improving quality education and access for all. Um, in, in this context of teachers, what, even what, what Diane was saying a few minutes ago about the, how we can reach teachers now and what we can reach teachers with. We could talk a lot about that and I, I wanna, and I'm sure that many people on this call must know Marie Schumann in, in Leonard Cheshire and the fabulous work that Marie is doing. I just, you know, I, I just, everything that I'm saying about Western Kenya, I should really just be saying Marie and her team. So. That we're, we're, we're learning an awful lot there and the work that they're doing under Girls Education Challenge is, is magnificent. And there, what we're really focusing on, and this is where I'm gonna to try to connect the dots because the question about even the GPE funding that, that Julia was just referring to, how, and it relates to the monitoring point, how the outcomes for children with disabilities get measured, get looked at, and the evidence that gets brought to bear on the question of how did that COVID-19 money advance inclusion 
that that's a key question for measurement as well and the monitoring um, that that I think if you know we're, we're doing everything we can to try and make sure that that in this moment in the interventions that we're doing and particularly with Leonard Cheshire in Western Kenya that's where I think for me at any rate in the work that we're doing that's where the most exciting part of it is going on because of the thought process because of the attention to detail because of the thoroughness of the intervention and, under, and the understanding on the ground of, of exactly the context Diane was describing. The teachers are there as a resource. In the village, maybe there's a device. One thing we've certainly seen is that the device of choice now in homes where in, in low resource settings, the device of choice is a phone. In most cases, in many cases, it's not a smartphone, but it's not a radio as it was maybe 30 years ago. The device of choice if the family has one device in the home, it will be a phone. So we're, we're trying to leverage that low resource infrastructure. And, and to the points that Sean was making earlier, it, 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 it kind of kills me when we talk about video and television even, because so few people have televisions in their homes during this COVID-19 response. And while the stuff that we're doing in video shows great in a slide presentation here on this call, I think most of the people in this call know that, that the actual impact that you can have through that broadcasting is limited. You have to be able to reach down into the home. You have to be able to reach the teacher even while the teacher's out of school and building evidence, building evidence of impact as well as the cost effectiveness of what one does, what we do in this moment. I think that is what can have the most impact on advancing equity and even application of UDL principles as we go forward. So I'm sorry, I was trying to connect a lot of dots there, but I hope at least some of it resonated. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Well, a powerful, um, powerful message. And as you say, touched on a few of the questions we didn't have time to get to. Um, so much appreciated. Everyone, I'm sorry, we have run out of time. We've run over time. Uh, brilliant questions. We will follow up with the panelists afterwards um, so that we address as many of these as possible um, in, in an FAQ document. Um, but I just want to um, uh, close by thanking everybody for joining us today to coming together around this important, important effort um, around supporting education in, in these really challenging circumstances anyway, and now even more complex. So we really appreciate it. And big thanks to our panelists for their powerful words and practical recommendations today. There were a few questions around around teachers. We did do a webinar on teachers last week. You can find the recording on the website. There have also been some great questions around gender and that will be the topic for Monday's webinar. Um, so please do join us for that. Um, and we will of course share the recording of this with all of you along, along with the slides and the resources that were mentioned today. I'm sorry to cut us off in the middle of a, a brilliant discussion, but thanks everyone for joining us. And um, yeah, we appreciate all the work you're doing and we'll, we'll be in touch, continue to connect. Thanks everyone.